Firstly, Jazakallah uh, khair, um, everyone, for making it onto this webinar. I know that whenever you see the word investment and finance and pensions, uh, I know that for most people, it has the same effect um, as uh, sleep tablets. So uh, well done on making it here on a Saturday. Really appreciate that. Uh, and also Jazakallah khair to Bima for um, putting this whole thing together and you know really caring about this topic, which I think is a really vital topic, not just from uh, our pockets perspective, but I'll, but also from a, a wider uh, you know impact perspective. And I'll and I'll talk about that as we go through this, inshallah. So high level, what I, what I want to leave you with today is three things. Firstly, I want to give you um, four tiers of Islamic of personal finance. So these are four things that you really should be uh, looking to address systematically one after another. Uh, secondly, I'll talk to you a little bit about the three essentials of investing. So these are three principles that need to underpin absolutely all of your investments, regardless of what asset class you go for. And then finally, I'll give you a bit of a whistle stop tour through various different investment categories. And uh, let me just preface this entire presentation by saying that I appreciate that this is a limited period of time, but inshallah, we have a whole wealth of resources on the website. And also, we'll actually be doing um, a free uh, Halal Invest Fest, which is just a free uh, three day. Um, uh, festival on YouTube uh, starting from Tuesday. So we'll, you'll get three more hours of this sort of thing and we'll break down a lot more of the stuff that we talk about today in those sessions. So if interested, you can check that out um, on, on our YouTube. So what, are, what is IFG? Who am I and what, this is, what is this all about? So, you know, Jazakallah khair to the sister for the uh, very kind introduction. I hope that, you know, I'm at least 30% of, uh, you know, the good things that, you know, you, you attribute to us. In terms of, you know, what IFG actually does, it started off as a labor of love, as a blog, a community blog about five years ago. And we started writing about Islamic finance and investment and people seem to find it quite useful. And we realized um, very quickly that, you know, this was actually something really important for the community. And the feedback that we were getting was that, you know, we really, really need um, this kind of thing. And, and things kind of progressed and, you know, we, we ultimately realized that our mission uh, in life was IFG. So we quit our corporate jobs and uh, we went uh, after IFG full time uh, as of earlier this year. And the thinking behind IFG is how can we actually make Muslims better off economically? How can we make them uh, financially better off? And why do we care about that? The reason why we care about that is because we realize that Muslims are 25% of the world's population, but they're about a quarter, about 20% poorer than the rest of the world. And in the UK, about half of the Muslim community live in the 10% poorest areas. And so, you know, the economic aspect of um, the Muslim uh, Ummah is sadly not very uh, promising right now. And in the top 100 companies in the world, only one of them is actually from a Muslim origin country, and that's Aramco. So that's down to oil. Um, and really, if it was proportionate, it should be about 25%. So we said, okay, clearly there's an issue here. And if we, you know, we all, we all get one chance at life. If we can really try and move the needle on this and get Muslims back to even keel, then we'll have done a good thing. Um, and so for us, there are two ways that we think that we can make Muslims better off economically. One is by help sorting out people's personal finances, um, getting them started on their investing journeys, getting them onto the property ladder, getting them out of debt, all that sort of thing, just demystifying everything, uh, being like a Muslim Martin Lewis, uh, if, you know, if you want to think of it that way. And then the second big thing that we do is we support entrepreneurs um, you know, to become the next big thing. And that's what we do with our angel syndicate, which I'll touch upon really briefly at some point in this uh, seminar. But the majority of this uh, seminar is all about the first thing. So it's about getting you to sort out your personal finances um, and, uh, and helping you out with that journey. So uh, without further ado, let's dive in. The first section is all about the four essential steps that everyone needs to be doing uh, in order for them to have a successful uh, finance journey. Firstly, you know, what is personal finance? So, uh, you know, I, I, many people will have many different views of what personal finance is um, and, you know, how you would define it, how you would approach it. But in a nutshell, 
it's our attitude to money and our attitude to investing. Um, and also it includes uh, not just our uh, you know, salaries and our careers, but it also includes a holistic approach to life, quite frankly, because pretty much everything that we do has a monetary aspect to it. So I think personal finance is actually something that you can't really put in a separate bucket. It's you know, very much wedded to the wider philosophy of life that you have. And if you aren't really thinking about personal finance, then it's really important that you do because you know you're you're um, often overlooking a really important, uh, consistent theme that would be relevant to pretty much every area of your life, from work to um, you know your home life uh, to your hobbies, etc. Now, in terms of the four key things that you should be looking to address. Uh, the first is that you need to look to clear your debts. Now, um, you know, the reason why you would want to clear your debts, um, there's, a, there's a bunch of reasons. Firstly, from an Islamic perspective, it is highly, highly encouraged that you should clear your debts. Um, and, you know, the, the inheritors of uh, someone who has passed away who has debts are encouraged to pay off that person's debts because these are an amana and he will be held accountable on the day of judgment if those debts are not cleared. And, you know, there are a hadith about how, um, you know, the prophet and their companions would not necessarily pray on a person until, you know, their debts were fully cleared. So it's that level of importance from an Islamic perspective, but also from a purely personal finance perspective, it's crucial because most debts that you have will have interest accruing on them. Uh, and this applies to credit cards, it's applied to bank debts, uh, all sorts of other debts. So you don't want uh, the, the debt to go on for very long because every debt that goes on for a year longer will add to uh, you know, the, the amount that's due. And for every year that you don't pay off that amount, the, the compound interest kicks in and it actually becomes larger and larger. So you want to really nip it in the bud early doors. So that's the first thing. Um, and what do I mean by debt? So, you know, many of you might have um, a mortgage, hopefully an Islamic mortgage, or you might have student finance and you might be thinking, hang on, is he saying, should I, you know, should I just focus on clearing my mortgage and my student finance? No, I'm not necessarily saying that. What I'm saying is that you should try and clear your short term debts, things like uh, credit card debts or, uh, you know, if you've got payday loans, you should definitely be clearing those off. Uh, any other short term loans that you might have from friends and family, try and clear the, those off uh, ASAP. The reason why um, student finance and Islamic mortgages don't necessarily need to be cleared off straight away are for a few reasons. Firstly, because they are large amounts of money. So if you started clearing those off, you would probably be parking significant life events for the next 20 years um, because you would be parking uh, getting married, for example. Uh, you could be parking uh, going on Hajj. Uh, you might not buy um, a house if you've got a student debt and you want to pay that off. So there's a lot of things that might be put on hold if you um, focus on just paying off these, uh, these debts. Um, and but but having said that, I think the approach to take with student finance is you should um, you know you should definitely look to try and pay it off, especially as the majority of these pe people in this seminar will be medics. So doctors will typically end up paying off the entire student finance amount before they retire, uh, because the doctors will typically have a higher salary by the end of their careers. So it is actually in your interest to accelerate and try and get that payment done ASAP because that will reduce the amount of interest that you have to pay on it over the long term. And that can really, really add up. Um, so what I'm saying in a nutshell then on student finance is try and pay it uh, relatively quickly, um, but don't put yourself in hardship and make that the sole end of your life. Um, you know, if, if the standard payment is 200 pounds and you can afford to make a 300 pound payment, that's the kind of thing that I'm saying you should do in terms of decision making. Um, on Islamic mortgages, technically, um, you know, the Islamic mortgages are not a debt in, uh, in the Islamic sense of the word because they are, uh, you know, a diminishing musharaka agreement, which is a partnership where you own a percentage of the uh, property and the bank owns a percentage of the property. So it's not technically um, a debt. However, of course, in uh, in the kind of you know from an individual's perspective, it is a debt. Um, on Islamic mortgages, I would say that you should try and aim to have um, a life uh, time uh, period for an Islamic mortgage of roughly you know between 10 and 25 years. When you start going above the 25-year mark, that's 
uh, when you uh, that's when you have um, you know certain difficulties because that's when the the amount that you are going to pay over the long term really really significantly hikes up. So just make sure that you're not paying too much for the long term. Then the other thing with Islamic mortgages that you should think about is you know if you're going to pay. Uh, you know, and try and clear your Islamic mortgage, and uh, and you know, ultimately that will mean that you you know you're not paying the the rental payment that you pay every every month for your house. You know, people uh, are quite. It makes sense intuitively. However, the key metric to look at is is my return on this extra two thousand pounds that I have going to be greater if I invest it? Or is it going to be greater if I put it into my Islamic mortgage? Now, if you are going to put that extra £2,000 in an Islamic mortgage and that reduces your payment by a small fraction, which it will, it will only reduce it by a small fraction because uh, ultimately interest rates these days, which is what the Islamic mortgage will be linked to as well, are you know, somewhere between 1% and 3% in terms of the payments that you will have to uh, you will owe to the bank whereas if you can uh, obtain a 5 6% return on that same 2000 pounds then actually that could well be a better option for you uh, over the long run um, so I wouldn't, uh, you know, people instinctively when they think about clearing debts, they think I need to get rid of my Islamic mortgage or my mortgage. Uh, and that's, you know, a really financially prudent thing to do. Uh, it often can be, but uh, only if you've got really long term uh, mortgages, not necessarily if you've got short term mortgages. The next thing after that is have a three to six months buffer. So just like, uh, you know, if you uh, if you fall ill, for example, or there's other some kind of difficulties or coronavirus happens, then you've got something to fall back on. Uh, then after that, once you've got this six month buffer, then you should be looking to get yourself on the property ladder. If you aren't already on the property ladder, you should look to stop renting. And this is really important uh, because if, uh, you, if you go on our website and you go on islamicfinanceguru.com and Islamic mortgages at the top, uh, there's a drop down and you'll see should I buy or should I rent uh, calculator. If you type in uh, your details on there, the, you know, the numbers, just run that calculator, you will find that most people will end up losing literally hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, over the course of their uh, lifetime because they continued renting as opposed to going for uh, halal investing, uh, going for uh, their, own, uh, their own property. And the, uh, the issue that uh, you face if you go down that road is that long term, we are in a world where people who own assets are people who get richer and people who do not own assets will get poorer. Uh, this is due to inflation and due to the kind of complicated way that money is created in our economic system. And uh, and if you if you look at the financial crisis and what happened thereafter, the financial crisis in 2008 uh, led to the uh, the government printing money essentially and putting that into the economy. And that then led to the most significant increase in house prices and pro, uh, stock market prices uh, that we've seen in a, in a long while. Uh, and the people who did well out of it were people who are on the property ladder. People who are renting did not do well out of it. So that's why it's really important uh, to get yourself onto the property ladder. And then the final thing that you should do, once you've got those basics out of the way, clear your debt, get your six month uh, emergency fund, and then get yourself on the property ladder. Once you've got all of those sorted, then you can now start really building your investment portfolio and we'll talk about what to do with that um, in, inshallah in the slides to come. Now I'm going to really quickly whiz through this uh, slide because I could probably talk about an hour on this slide but it kind of gives you a sense of the various different bits and bobs uh, that you should be looking at with, uh, with your life essentially. So at birth you should check in with uh, your financial advisor, islamicfinanceguru.com, do a bit of Googling uh, because there are key things that you could be doing uh, with your child's birth. And honestly, you know, people talk about, oh, you know, is it haram or halal to take out student finance? You don't, you wouldn't be in that quandary if you started saving just 25 quid, 50 quid a month every time a child was born because that's all it takes. And by the time that child gets to the age of 18, 
you will have saved up enough for the student finance, um, in, enough for the, uh, for the university fees, but also actually uh, to pay a considerable way towards the, um, you know, the, the, the costs of university as well if the person is living in a different city, et cetera. So really planning in, in advance can be very, very lucrative. Then uh, university, of course, is a key point where uh, you need to be looking at your finances and your family's finances. And I would encourage people uh, to you know, really uh, try and avoid student loans as much as possible. There are you know, various different fatawa that um, allow, make it permissible. Um, however, you know, there are, it is still you know, somewhat of a gray area as there are people who disagree with that. Uh, and I personally would try and avoid it as much as possible before having to resort to it if you absolutely have to. Uh, then with your first job, the big thing that you can do is make sure that you sign up to your pension. Uh, and the NHS pension, before people ask, is perfectly permissible to sign up to. And there are two different kinds of pension that you can have. You can have a direct uh, contribution, uh, defined uh, contribution uh, pension, or you can have a defined benefit pension. And the NHS uh, pension is a defined benefit pension. What that means is that you get uh, a set amount at the end of the uh, life of the pension linked to the number of years that you, are, uh, that you have in service, et cetera, et cetera. And that does not necessarily link to the underlying things that this uh, money has been invested in. And what that means is that from an Islamic perspective, this is just seen as a part of your contract, your employment contract, and it's just a deferred payment on your employment contract. And therefore, it's perfectly permissible. So you don't necessarily have to worry too much about the, the halal or haram of it. Uh, and the defined contribution uh, pensions, if you've got a private pension, this will be applicable. If you work for a private company, this will be applicable. You should make sure that your uh, pension is going into a halal uh, stocks and shares fund. So, you know, you'll have automatic uh, selections made for you when you sign up for the pension. That will not be halal. So you have to ring up the pension provider uh, or, or go online and just kind of tweak that around to make sure there are halal investment, um, the halal funds that you are invested in. And uh, if you're stuck for what halal funds to look for, you can come onto our website, go on the halal investment page, and there's a long list of them. Uh, also, you can just literally search for Islamic or halal or Sharia in the search function of your pension provider, and there's not going to be very many that they list. Uh, most likely, it will be the HSBC Amana Fund, um, and if that's the only one you have, then that's the only one that you go for. If any of you find that your pension provider does not um, does not have uh, any uh, Islamic pension, uh, then uh, get in touch with me because this is one of my bugbears and um, I'm more than happy to pick it up with your, uh, with your employer. Uh, and most employers, when we've been in touch, they will very quickly see sense and, and get that sorted. So uh, that's the first job. Then uh, when it gets to marriage, again, you should check in uh, on your personal finances, um, potentially get yourself an Islamic will done, because at this point you will have significant uh, amounts of money. Uh, so you want to make sure that it's tax efficient. Uh, you want to start thinking about how you uh, manage your tax affairs, because you might well be paying significant amounts of tax at this point and you can use marriage allowance and you can use other uh, you know other uh, uh, tax saving mechanisms uh, to achieve good uh, good results and for that you know talk to a tax advisor or do a little bit of googling online these days google can uh, answer 90 percent of our issues uh, then when you um, the next step along is you know you go for your first house the uh, the big takeaway message here is that you should um, go for at least a 20% um, deposit on your mortgage, uh, Islamic mortgage, because that will significantly uh, decrease the amount of payment that you have to make. Like it's a 2.8 or 3% uh, payment that you have to make on 20%, and it's about 4, 4.5 on 10% which is very, very significant. So if you can, I just save a bit, a bit more before you get yourself onto the property ladder if, you can, uh, if that kind of works out for you. Then uh, in terms of the spare cash, you should look to start building a diversified portfolio. And then for death, obviously, you know, it's Islamic wills. Now, um, how do you become like Waqas Buffett? How do you actually start investing and doing the fun stuff 
So uh, the first thing is you should actually be investing. And people often get scared with investing because they don't know where to put their money and they think they'll lose it all. Uh, there's a fine balance here because if you do nothing, that is a decision in itself and you have inflation eating away at your money uh, roughly 2% every year. So over the course of uh, you know a decade, that's going to be a very, very, very significant amount of money that you will have lost. So no action is still a decision that you've made and it's a bad one. So you should really strongly consider making a decision. Uh, at the same time, you want to make sure that you're investing in things that are prudent and make sense for you. And this is where webinars like this and other resources online can be really helpful. And then the second thing is you should invest like the 1%. So what do the 1% actually do? They invest in three different things. Uh, they, they have three different kind of key uh, principles that they adhere to. The first is that they invest in a consistent and regular way. The second thing is they diversify. And then the third thing is they have a long-term time horizon. And, and I'm not just like saying this, right? I'll, I'll actually give you a, a few stats to give you a sense of, you know, this is actually how the high net worths invest. Uh, but also this is like a, a brief anecdote. So in my previous life as a corporate lawyer, uh, I was a funds formation lawyer and we used to uh, set up private equity and venture capital funds. Um, and uh, and we saw the kind of people that were investing in those funds. And of the, you know, the top 10 uh, billionaires in the world, uh, it, it just happened that over the last two years, I've worked with um, uh, the uh, Jeff Bezos and his investment um, arm and what they were looking at investing in, uh, Larry Page, the founder of Google, um, and, uh, and also uh, the, the Gates Foundation. So, you know, when I say that this is how the 1% invest, you know, we actually saw that this is how the 1% were investing. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that these guys are looking at. The first thing was consistent and regular. So now if you look at the net worth of uh, our man Warren Buffett, for many, many years, it wasn't a significant amount. Like obviously, uh, you know, if by the age of 39, you've got 25 million, you're doing all right. But if you notice the key spikes in Warren Buffett's wealth came over the last few uh, years, over the last few decades. And this is the benefit of being consistent and regular and the benefits of compound interest or the, in our case, compound investment returns. Uh, so really make sure that you're consistent and regular. I know that sounds like really boring, but honestly, that is uh, the secret uh, to really successful investing. On, you know, boring and consistent and regular stuff when it comes to investments is great. Like I cannot tell you the amount of times that we've had calls from people. Uh, so we do these like Friday um, drop-in sessions where anyone can call for 10 minutes. And, uh, and if you're interested, you know, you can go on our website, go on the contact us page and book it in. Um, and the amount of times we've had calls from people who've uh, put half of their life savings into some uh, Forex scheme, that uh, someone offered, you know, said that they'll triple their money for them. It's really quite surprising, and even quite educated people do this. So please, please, if it sounds too good to be true, then it usually is. Consistent, regular, and boring is uh, what we like when it comes to investing. The second thing is, um, you know, make sure that you diversify. So this is how, on the left, we invest. Uh, so we will be looking at uh, stocks, cash, and bonds. In our case, as Muslims, not so much bonds because sadly they're not that well available. But on the other side, you'll see that you've got a whole range of different options out there. So this is how the 1% invest. They put real estate, private equity, stocks, cash, bonds, hedge funds, and other things as well. So really diversifying their portfolio. And your grandmother was right on this. And uh, she said, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, you know, Dadi Jan was bang on. That's what you should do. You shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. Otherwise, uh, things can uh, end up going badly. Like, I mean, look on on the on our side. If stocks take a hit, our overall portfolio is going to take a big hit. However, on the rich uh, portfolio side, if stocks take a hit, it's not so much of a concern because uh, you know they're a small percentage of the portfolio, and usually, uh, you know, where where stocks are taking a hit something else will be going up. And if you've got enough uh, dogs in the race, so to speak, or enough horses in the race in lots of different races, 
then you know where stocks are going down bonds might be going up or where property might be going up or gold might be going up but if you don't own any of anything else other than stocks then you're going to be scuppered and then finally uh, long-term time horizon so if you look stock markets over the last 20 years they have gone up and down up and down but consistently the trend has been upwards and this is largely i think due to uh well firstly growth human civilization generally grows and uh, adds value to the world um, as we go along but also secondly uh, largely speaking we have inflation that uh, means that our money gets less and less, less and less valuable and the stock market typically will perform at least at inflation um, but usually a bit more than inflation as well great uh I appreciate I, I've got not, not so much time, so um, I'll try and whiz through these. So the five main investment categories, you've got uh, stocks and shares, um, and uh, let's dive into that first and foremost. So with stocks and shares, uh, you have um, probably five, uh, four different options that you can go for. The first is you can talk to a financial advisor. This is probably uh, beneficial for you if you have assets of over 100,000 uh, that you're looking to invest because financial advisors will charge you for their advice. Uh, they are very worth it if you have a larger asset pot uh, to work with. Um, the second uh, option is go for a robo-advisor such as Wahid Invest uh, or you have others in the Middle East such as Sarwa and now there are you know, lots of other options coming onto the market but Wahid is the most prominent of them. They're great because they kind of give you a ready-made portfolio based on your risk profile and, and on off you go. Um, you will of course get charged a small fee by these robo-advisors but typically it is fairly affordable. Um, I appreciate there's a few questions coming in as well and shall I'll turn to them uh, in the last five minutes uh, and just whiz through all of those as well. Then, in terms of the other options you've got for stocks and shares, you have DIY. You could actually buy individual stocks and shares. I would recommend only doing this if you really want to invest in your investment uh, education and really do that properly. Because if you don't do that properly and you're just kind of going on on a wing and a prayer, then uh, it's not you know you're not being uh, you know a very good judge of what you should be doing with your money, uh, and you know you're you're more, much, much more likely to end up doing worse uh, than if you had just put the money into you know, an Islamic fund or something like that. Uh, and then finally, you've got uh, pensions. Uh, so everyone's got a pension and they will actually have exposure to the stock market already and fairly significant exposure. Then you've got Sukuk. Sukuk are the Islamic version of bonds. Again, four different options, financial advisor, robo-advisory with Wahid Invest. Uh, then you've got DIY. You can go online and go into something like AJ Bell or Hargreaves Lansdowne, and you can uh, potentially invest in a Sukuk fund. Unfortunately, there's not very many of them out there. And to my knowledge, the best way to do it is actually via Wahid uh, because uh, it's just Unfortunately, there are not very many sukuks out there uh, these days. And uh, compared to the mainstream bond market, where, where there's many, many options to go for, there's just not many sukuk options. And then finally, if you are uh, a relatively more affluent individual, there are some uh, slightly more high risk but high yielding uh, sukuk options or fixed income options that you can go for by joining uh, the IFG syndicate. Uh, or actually just visiting our Halal investment page and you'll find them there, people like Godwin um, and others. And I know I'm whizzing through this and you'll be like, hang on, hang on, what what, what happened there? Uh, don't worry, you've got the course coming up and also you can just drop us a line or you can just Google it or um, you know, there's, there's lots of other ways um, that you can get in touch. This is not going to be something that, if you if you want to learn about investing, it's not something that is going to happen in you know just 45 minutes. I'm just kind of giving you a broad lie of the land here. Uh, in terms of property, uh, you can go for property crowdfunding. Uh, so people like Yielders uh, are great. You've got uh, Igloo uh, Crowd as well, but Yielders are the a much, much bigger one. Land crowdfunding by people like Intro Crowd. So they actually invest in land and then uh, go for planning permission and you know make money that way. Then you can go for uh, REITs. So these are real estate investment trusts. Some of these are actually Sharia compliant. Um, we need to do an article on listing out the Sharia compliant ones because they're not obvious, you know, they're not listed as Islamic REIT or anything like that. You have to kind of do the digging, leave that with us. And then you can, uh, you know, do your own uh, 
buy to let on a DIY basis, that's a good way of getting access to property. And then you've got an Islamic mortgage for your own property as well. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll actually, uh, we'll, we'll answer the questions right at the end of the webinar, I'm, I'm getting told, so we'll, we'll carry on inshallah. Uh, on the, you know, the rough spread, by the way, guys, on where you should be putting your property, your, your portfolio overall, you know, there's no hard and fast rule, but the way that I'd approach it is you're looking, you know, the middle of the road kind of portfolio, you're probably looking at somewhere like 40% into property, uh, maybe 30 to 40% into stocks and shares, and then about 20% into alternative assets. And what I mean by alternative assets is things that are a little bit more um, high risk, high reward. They, they give you the kind of growth element of your portfolio. So the stocks and shares, you're probably over the lifetime looking at somewhere between a five and 7% annual return. Um, and on property, you're looking at somewhere between a five and 7% um, annual return again. Um, and it kind of you know carries on growing slowly. And then on alternative assets, you're looking at somewhere, you know, eight, nine, ten percent plus in return. But of course, this is money that you could potentially end up losing some or even sometimes all of, depending on what you go for. Um, but overall, if you have a portfolio based approach, and even in the 20 percent alternative assets, you have a portfolio based approach, then you will, um, you know, you'll be significantly decreasing any downside risk and significantly increasing your upside risk. Then you've got uh, savings accounts. So obviously you should go for Islamic banks. And uh, the reason why savings accounts can be good is they are uh, somewhat inflation busting. Uh, so if you just need to park some money somewhere, then rather than just leaving in your current account, put it into an Islamic account and get some uh, you know, Islamic returns on it. Um, so that hedges against the inflation that's going to eat it away otherwise. Then you've got alternative assets. So alternative assets is typically investing in private companies. So public companies are stocks and shares and equities, large publicly listed companies. Private companies are where you're investing in startups. So you could do that via our angel syndicate, ifg.vc. Uh, you could do it via crowdfunding websites like Cedars or Crowdcube. You could do it even DIY. If you're someone who's deeply embedded in a particular uh, industry or you invest, you're really embedded in the venture capital networks, then uh, you should do that. Um, my high level advice on this would be go and invest with people with good networks. And obviously, you know, I say IFG.VC, but actually there's lots of other angel syndicates as well. But to my knowledge, I think IFG.VC is the only kind of Sharia compliant focused one. But, you know, high level, go for people with good networks and angel syndicates or funds that invest in, in venture capital. And the reason why is because in venture capital, the majority of returns, so 60 to 70% of returns, will go to the top four or 5% um, of um, you know, people who are investing. And, uh, and that's why you, know, you want to make sure that you're investing in the best quality deals, um, as opposed to just kind of you know, the spray and pray approach. And then finally, you have uh, SME financing as well. So SME financing is where you have um, halal um, loans given out to um, businesses like pharmacies, dentists, GP practices even. And there's really only one active player right now in the market called uh, Gardus. And uh, you can check them out on our website on the halal investing page. Uh, you can find out more about them there. And uh, again, they essentially allow you uh, to get a fixed return on lending to uh, private companies. Uh, so that might give you like a 10% 10, 10 return annually. This is obviously at risk capital because even though it's unlikely for a pharmacy to default, it is possible for a pharmacy to default. Oh, and one other thing I should mention on the private company side of things. So if you invest in startups, you can take advantage of significant tax breaks. So if you invest £10,000 in a startup that's um, you know, in the UK and it's SEIS registered, you will get back £5,000 of tax in that first year. So it, you know, it literally will decrease your, you know, it's a 50% return on your investment straight away if you want to think of it that way. Uh, and if the startup collapses, another 20% or so um, will be covered by HMRC. So it's a really generous scheme to encourage people to invest in, uh, you know, venture capital. And uh, the government wants this to happen because it knows that this is where we grow. And by the way, you know, the reason why IFG really care about this area is because we know that if we can create one Muslim entrepreneur that you know creates the next big thing, then we have really, really moved the needle in one big fell swoop. Uh, and 
you know, Muslim investors who are investing in this, again, you know, they will get significant returns. So annually, you're looking at around 20 to 30 percent annualized returns with startups. It is an illiquid investment, though, so you, your money is going to be locked away for at least seven to ten years. But it is, um, you know, it is something that's highly, highly impactful. That's why, you know, I personally care about it. So that's kind of it, guys. Uh, that's kind of, um, you know, whistle stop tour through um, personal finance to, uh, you know, re kind of calibrate where we've got to. Why every single one of us should be on top of their finances is not just because it will make you better off. It's because I think that it is a duty upon all of us, an Islamic duty upon all of us, to make sure that our money is being uh, utilized in the best way, shape or form. And, uh, and that's because it will benefit the ummah um, over the long term. And if we do not do that, then we are going to personally harm our own pocket. But for me, more importantly, um, we're not going to be doing right by you know, our wider duty as a community. So you know, in effect, making yourself better off is actually doing something that I think is a morally and Islamically a good thing to do because you will be helping out with um, you know, the position of the Muslim Ummah vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world. Um, and I appreciate that you know, this has been pretty intense. So uh, again, to reiterate, we've got the Halal Invest Fest next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, one hour, 6 p.m. on our YouTube channel. We also, if you just go on our website and subscribe, then we send you a free crash course via emails, um, and that will allow you to you know, reflect and digest slowly the various different materials we'll be sending out to you um, over the next uh, you know, week or so once you sign up. So that's a, a good way of, um, I guess, getting into this. Uh, I think this is the end of my presentation. Jazakallah uh, khair. I'll be uh, around for the questions at the end. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, um, Ibrahim, for this useful, informative presentation. I'm sure we'll have many questions directed your way. Our next speaker is um, Dr. Muhammad, Dr. Mona Abdul Aziz, who will talk about interest-free loans. So, um, Dr. Mona is director of public health for Salford. She has a medical degree um, from Sudan, and first started her career in public health in 1992 as an academic. She, mashallah, also holds a PhD from Cambridge University, and she is professionally accredited as a specialist in public health, both in Sudan and in the UK. Muna works as a public health consultant um, in, um, as I said, in Salford and also in Sheffield, and she's worked in Sudan for three years, where she's where she helped um, establish uh, public health in Sudan in her role as a deputy director. She led the health business program and, and health in planning champion inclusive health in Warrington. Dr. Muna is the chair and founder of UB Credit Unite, United Limited, which is the first Sharia compliant credit union, union in the UK. Thank you, Dr. Muna, for making the time to join us today. So assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm really pleased to be here with you today and I'm here to talk to you about Yorbi Credit Union Limited. And before you ask, so what is Yorbi? So the name Yorbi comes from the Arabic, uh, the Quran verse, يَمْحَقُ اللَّهُ riba wa yurbi sadaqat. And what this says is that interest is devalued, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God will, will increase in value the charity that we give. So for us, uh, my story started with Yorbi in January 2015 when my son was going to university and we realized that the um, student finance was interest bearing. And of course, that is extremely challenging, not just to me, but to all uh, everyone in the audience, yourselves as viewers. Um, so while the talk is, is uh, entitled Interest Free Student Loans, Actually, this is a story about savings, about starting early, and it's about how we use our collective wealth as a Muslim community. So it builds really closely uh, following on from the talk that Brother Ibrahim has just given us. But this time we're looking for the reward of charity rather than a return on investment. So 
student finance, of course, uh, we all know that tuition and maintenance loans are available for students at UK universities, but that these are interest bearing. The only discretion we have is additional support for students with a disability or dependents. But interest is accrued, is charged from the very first day of payment of that student loan, the first day at university, until the loan is paid off or written off. In fact, interest is charged while the student is at university at the rate of the retail price index plus 3%. And after graduating, the interest rate on your student loan is set according to your income, depending on your earnings. So anything from just the retail price index uh, onwards to up to 3% over and above that. And this starts from the April after you finish your course until the loan is repaid in full. So what this means for a three-year university degree is that where someone is just borrowing tuition, which is £9,250 as it stands today, by the end of three years, they will have um, borrowed £27,750, but actually they owe Student Finance UK more than £30,000, so that's £31,000. And that's because of the retail price index, which was 2.6% um, on add on top of 3%. So these are the current interest and fee charges in 2020-2021. But if somebody is borrowing tuition and maintenance, so just taking an example of a maximum loan of 16,000 per year, instead of actually just uh, borrowing 48,000 pounds, the student unfortunately will owe in excess of 53,000 pounds. And that's just on graduation. And after graduation, of course, the repayments are um, sort of according to your earnings. So if it was just the undergraduate loan that you've borrowed, you'd be repaying 9% of all your income over 26,000 pounds. But if you also add a postgraduate loan on top of that, you will need to be repaying 6% of your income over 21,000 pounds. So in total, you may be repaying maybe up to 15% of your earnings above the 26K threshold. So just as an example, a, a high earning graduate who's just graduated in their first year and is earning 37,000 pounds, then they will be repaying interest of, of, of 1,271 pounds, but the repayment, which is 9% of their income, is less than 1,000 pounds. So their loan grows by 300 pounds just in that first year. We've been told that there is an alternative finance that will be Sharia compliant and it will come out from Student Finance UK, but we've been promised this from 2013. It's been designed to match the current scheme of repayments and the overall cost. So the harm that exists out of the interest bearing version is the same harm that people will feel following a takaful alternative finance. And even then, that's not likely to come in place before next year, 2021. So what can we do about this and what have we been doing about this as a community? We know some young people have given up or have deferred going to university. They're looking for scholarships, bursaries, anyone who'll give them an interest-free loan from family or friends. Well, maybe there's a chance if they can look for an apprenticeship where the employer agrees to pay for the degree. There's been a lot of lo lobbying by the Muslim community on this and it's, uh, you can see that on the Halal Student Loans website, which I've given you a link here. My slides include quite a lot of information and we'll be sharing this out with you as the audience following the presentation. So um, you'll get more information than what I'm actually saying here. So what is Yorbi? Yorbi is a credit union and it's like our social committees where people group together and pool their funds and one month somebody takes it and the other month another person takes it. You know what that is? Um, it, it's, it's not guaranteed, it's probably not safe if someone loses all their money and it sort of puts families and friends against each other. So we, we're set up as a credit union, which is an authorised, legal registered um, credit union. It's non-profit making, it's a cooperative where members do pool their deposits and they can borrow from that at no interest. So this is the first credit union in the UK that's set, that is setting up as Sharia compliant from the start. So we offer people a facility to save up, to save for big things. We call that save your nest egg. We also offer uh, interest-free loans for students once we've got all that capital uh, pooled together. We were authorized in January. So, so far we've been able to bring together about 100,000 pounds from pooled savings. 
with your help and with others in the community, we hope to be able to build that fund and to be able to do more with it. We'd like to invest in education and personal development, and that's the whole sort of starting point for us. But of course, people can be saving for many other reasons, not just student um, and undergraduate or postgraduate. They could be looking for personal development, professional development. And because this is about keeping people free of debt and hardship, it is also a channel for Zakat for us to develop young people and communities in the UK. So how does it work? We encourage our members to start saving early, maybe at birth, primary school. It's always a good time to start saving now. And that helps you spread the cost of those big expenses like a university degree. It means that you've got savings that reduce the amount you require for a loan. And while you're saving, your wealth helps other people in the meantime. So savings from a group of members can be loaned out to students to cover the cost of study or exams this year. We can offer loans between 3,000 to 5,000 pounds. And once the capital grows, we can offer much larger loans in future. These loans can be for undergraduate, postgraduate, CPD, exam fees, or, or any other study. But legally, these loans have to be repaid within five years. So this is definitely unlike Student Finance UK, where you are sort of where your loan continues for up to 30 years. So this is an example to show you what we mean by how to spread the cost. So for an undergraduate degree, for example, someone who started to save £500 a month for two years can borrow £9,000 per year for three years and keep repaying at the same rate that they've been saving, which is £500 a month. At the end of five years from graduation, they'll have paid off the entire cost. So in this example, just this is an individual who's so spread the cost of the university degree, the three-year degree over 10 years. We've got similar examples for people who are saving 250 pounds per month. Again, they can repay in 300 pounds a month by the end of the degree. At the end of 11 years, they'd have spread the cost of their degree. And similarly for postgraduate or for CPD and exams. So you can see that this is an affordable way in which people can start to save and borrow and help each other out. So I'll give you a few case studies of people we've come across, because what I'm saying to sort of really everybody who gets in touch with us is if you look, you shall find. Definitely, we know that um, God wages war against riba. And whenever you're walking away from riba, you know that God is lending you a helping hand. So we had a final year university student who'd got a job offer already, but they just needed their last university installment of 3000 pounds. They'd put themselves through university, working evenings, weekends, to a gap year in, in industry. Just this last stretch was so difficult. They were going to take a credit union loan with interest. So they needed a guarantor because they had no income to be able to borrow. When we advised them to ask family and friends to become their guarantor, the wonderful news was that the guarantor paid their fees straight away, so they didn't need to borrow at all. So if you look, you shall find. Another example about being debt-free, interest-free. So we have a young graduate who had already paid off 10,000 pounds of their student loan just one year from graduation. This amazing person fully intended to repay all the loan in two years, however hard it was. And they were working hard indeed. They hadn't realized interest started on the first day and they were already 32,000 pounds in debt on graduation. A few months later, and the debt had grown again by 200 pounds. So two steps forward, one step back but they're so committed and taken this first hard step we all wanted to help them get out of this huge debt so we advised they switch from student finance to an interest-free loan from family and friends or from other sponsors like ansar finance who you'll come to hear about or national zakat Fi uh, foundation who will come to hear about uh, as well later today so they will need a guarantor but hopefully they may come across a benefactor so you can see really that our young people are amazing and they are really, really doing their best. So as URB, we're looking for friends. In our first three months, we've had three donors give us 500 pounds each. We had two donors give us, give us 5,000 pounds each. And we've got lots of support from organizations, which helps us bring down our costs and it brings down, down the fees that we charge. One benefactor actually wanted to keep their savings so they're looking to keep their savings into your B so that it can be loaned out again and again and again. 
The great news is that benefactor could deposit up to £15,000 in the credit union and it would still be their money if they, need to use it, if they need to use it again in future. You can help too, of course. You can be a guarantor. We were contacted by a parent for advice to support their son through university. Now, they've deferred starting this September because the parent themselves hadn't taken the student loan. They were just paying off their own loan and they were just about to finish this year. So by deferring starting at university by one year, next year they can be the guarantor for their son to help them get through university too. And the thing that's really striking is that once you've got parents who've taken the student finance UK loan and have to borrow for 30 years, they can't help their children. But for us as a community, if we can really help people stay debt free, interest free, we'll be helping the next generation as well. So each student, as the credit union will loan £5,000, it will cost us an extra 500. That's because we're meant to keep that 10% liquidity at all times. But remember sorry, that as sorry. a sponsor, whatever sorry, you Dr. pay Mona. now, you'll be sorry, helping Mona. more students for many years. Sorry, Dr. Mona, we don't have much time. Um, would you mind wrapping up in two minutes? Thank you so much. Yes, I will do. I'm nearly there, thank you. So I'm calling out to you to join your B and start saving for a holiday, Hajj Umrah as a sponsor. You can even join with a payroll deduction from your wages. You can transfer your lump sums across from your bank. And um, we're only looking for a small amount of running costs, 8,000 pounds a year, compared to the sponsorship, which is in excess of 100,000 pounds. You can join your B through any organizations that you're already a member or through your places of worship. Actually, you can join your B as a member of BEMA. So we've been supported by very many individuals and groups and we'd like to have your support and we'd like to support you in return. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mona, for sharing your invaluable insight and experience with us. Um, our next speakers, and uh, we are fortunate to have two members of Ansar Finance with us today. Anjam Solfika and Umo Isa. Anjam is an experienced finance professional with several years of public health and charity sector experience, including the NHS and Greater Manchester Police. He is currently chairing various boards, including Ansar Finance Group, striving to provide interest-free finance solution to our communities in the UK. Umo Isa is the operational manager at Ansar Finance. Welcome both. You need to um that to miss uh, unmuted. Assalamualaikum, can you hear me? Assalamualaikum, can everybody hear yeah. me? Assalamualaikum. So yeah, as yeah. you can see from our first slide, okay, alhamdulillah. It's Dr. Lakhir for the invite. Um and as you can see from our first slide, we're here to help people out of debt and the you know the misery and the hardship that causes. In the first slide, you can see where you were approached by a young man who got himself into credit card debt over about £6,000. And he was overwhelmed by the interest he was paying on the credit card rather than paying his debt off. He approached us, Alhamdulillah, we, we were able to support him and get him out of this debt and Alhamdulillah, get his life back on track as well. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah, this didn't just cause him depression, obviously it caused him other illnesses as well. Alhamdulillah, we're, we're able to support him in that. The second picture on there you can see is of a family. Um, they were failing to meet basic needs. They didn't have any money, enough money for food and bills. Alhamdulillah, with the launch of our Zakat Fund in 2018, we were able to award them a payment. Mashallah, and also signposted them to local food banks um, where we were able to get them longer term support. Alhamdulillah. Um, Ansar uh, Finance uh, has also supported um, local businesses. Uh, one was Fit Lounge, who I will continue about later. We supported a, a junior doctor who wanted to further their career, but they couldn't because they didn't have um, transport to get to the hospital where they worked at. We supported them and Alhamdulillah, they carried on their career, mashallah. Um, our Zakat Fund has been a lifeline for many, many families during the lockdown. 
and even still yeah. beyond uh, we are being ap approached by families that are struggling to uh, buy food because obviously the breadwinner has become unemployed so alhamdulillah we're able to we're in that position to support them i'll hand you over to brother and uh, our chair anjum right, so ansar has existed for many years um, obviously in the basic principle of islam of fair distribution of the wealth as it says there you can see on the slide there's a couple of um, ayahs from surah Baqarah from our holy quran uh, where Allah prohibits the use of usury interest uh, and our fight and Ansar, Ansar's existence is against riba basically and obviously Allah, Allah declares war uh, on people who, who are believers and still like indulge themselves in the usury or, or, or the interest which is haram so our fight is against riba and that's why we exist that's the core principle that we work on uh, and then next slide um, so we we started uh, in 1994. Uh, we were the first um, provider of the Shia-based finance in the UK, and to my knowledge, we are still the only true, true in my eyes provider of the Shia-based finance in the UK. For the reason, uh, because we we only take the principal back, not even a penny from from people who borrow from us. And our objectives and aims are obviously change the way people think about interest-related transaction and provide help where they are suffering with interest related debt problems so we work with people uh, it's not just that we provide um, interest free loans we educate people we create awareness we attend seminars we attend talks um, to, to create the awareness which is kind of a bit of forgotten um, prohibition in islam that people you know some way or, or the other everyone is kind of involved in some sort of interest uh, be muslim or non-muslims uh, and obviously that creates unfair distribution of the wealth in the society. Uh, okay, so we've also launched a Zakat Fund in 2018, uh, which we're helping people with. So in the next slide, I'll just give you a bit of snapshot of um, comparison in terms of how Ansar is helping people against other providers of the loans, you know, as a high street bank or a, or a loan shark uh, in the system. So if we give 5,000 pound loan out to someone, obviously interest is 0%, if it's three, 36 pay payments, in terms of repayment period they'll be paying roughly 139 pound a month and we got back 5000 pound after three years no interest charged as compared to if it's a high street loan uh, of 5000 pound if a typical apr is five percent which could vary obviously anything between two percent to five seven percent based on personal profile of the person 36 monthly payments of 150 each 5395 return to the bank with 395 interest charged so obviously, if, if if they get the loan from us, they'll save that interest payment over three years. Uh, and then the final is Loan Shark. I've just used uh, these uh, figures from the website. I've used 91% APR. It could be a lot higher than that. Anything between 10% to 1500%. So just using as illustration, if it's again 36 payments of 409 pound each, they'll be returning 14,709 pound. Oh, almost 10,000 pound in interest if it's 91% APR. So you can see that the person taking 5,000 pound loan will never ever be able to pay that loan back because they'll never be able to pay even the interest back, let alone the principal. So that's our cause and that's our, you know, why we exist to provide people with interest-free loans. So on the next slide, I think I'll hand you back to Misa who will talk you through this slide. Alhamdulillah. So this slide just shows the um, the case I mentioned earlier. There's two sisters from uh, Essex, mashallah. They approached us because they'd set up um, a natural nutrition and skincare uh, business and they wanted to expand. So they approached us for some funds. Alhamdulillah, their application was successful and we were able to support them. Now, mashallah, they, support, they provide customers nationally with their products and services. And mashallah, the feedback we've had from them is that without the help of Ansar, they wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't be where they are today. Alhamdulillah. Okay. So uh, I'd just like to talk you through about our eligibility criteria and process. So obviously it all starts with filling an application form, which you can download from our website or ring our office to get the application form. We'll need 
to perform some sort of identification checks, names, addresses to confirm who who these people are who are applying for our loans for for various like money laundering and other processes that we need to be compliant with FC and government agencies. Uh, we'll be looking at income and expenditure profile of the applicant. Of course, anyone who is taking loan from us, they need to return. They need to be able to return that money to us because this money has that we we can package together to to loan out to people is 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 due to the generous donation of our donors. Uh, so we are custodian of that money. So we make sure that the money comes back. Uh, we'll be looking for proof of incomes like any other bank or any other loan provider would do. Employment checks. Uh, contracts or letters or anything. I think one additional um, element that we look for is a guarantor because all our loans are uns uh, not secured or anything. So we look for UK-based guarantor who in the event of if the original borrower can't pay the loan back, we can approach and they, 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 they can pay back the loan the original borrower took from us. Uh, so that's additional requirement we have. Um, we do perform credit checks to ensure that people do not have county court judgments or any default payments in the in the history. Uh, then obviously we have a loan panel who reviews the application and obviously either approve or reject or ask for more information. If the application is approved within 24 hours, the funds are transferred into the, into the borrower's accounts. Obviously they'll have to sign a um, number of documents and contracts at that point to ensure that our funds are secured at that point. Uh, and I think uh, the last slide is just like showing that we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, Facebook, we have our website www.ansarfinance.org and you can contact us on admin at ansarfinance.org or our phone number if you have any more questions. And it's not just taking loans from us uh, we'd, because we are, we are all volunteers, very few paid members of staff. So if anyone wants to join us in any voluntary capacity, anyone wants to suggest anything, anyone wants to make any improvements to our processes, or, or, or suggest us anything, we are happy to listen and happy to talk to them. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Anjam and Moisa, for this very clear presentation, full of practical and useful tips. Our next speaker, we're delighted to introduce Nima Raza from National Zakat Foundation. Nima Raza is a director of fundraising of National Zakat Foundation. He was the core member of Islamic Society of Britain and president of Young Muslim UK. Nima joined Islamic Relief in March two, 2007. His role included um, campaign manager, was also managing Islamic Relief 25th anniversary worldwide and in the communication of department within the UK. During his period, he developed experience of delivering training and developing marketing um, skills, event management and fundraising for a diverse range of clients and project, projects. Naeem currently runs his own marketing project management fundraising and campaign development consultancy and is regular presenter on Islam Channel. He is also the presenter and MC at this year's Global Peace and Unity event in London. Wonderful to have you to be part to wonderful to have you to be able to join us today. Uh, let me start at the beginning why NZF was set up the National Zakat Foundation. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, a young sister came to Islam, a new Muslim. She was in debt. There was nobody to help her and suddenly she committed suicide. So that was the severity of why the National Zakat Foundation was set up. It is the only organization in the UK that is uh, not only collecting zakat within the UK, but also distributing only within the UK. So we basically thriving to a closer Muslim community in the UK powered by zakat. Now we have the most um, advanced uh, zakat calculator in the country, I believe. We've got now a uh, very bespoke zakat calculations. If anyone has at least a one-to-one, -one, we can look at that as well. We spend a lot of our time trying to raise awareness of the third pillar of Islam, of zakat, educating people, helping them to calculate their zakat correctly. Uh, and then once we've collected it, we also verify applications that come to us um, uh, and support and distribute the zakat. So the kind of people uh, and kind of options of zakat where you can give your zakat and the kind of options that people apply for. We have a hardship relief fund, which is going to be running out at the end of this year, unfortunately, because of the number of people applying. There's an application every 15 minutes, uh, which is for basic costs like food, travel, clothing housing fund for people to live in affordable accommodation, rent arrears, work fund. This might be relevant to all of you uh, brothers and sisters who are online just now. For example, when the Syrian refugees 
arrived here, many of them were doctors. They didn't have the certification to practice here. So we gave zakat to fund them to become practicing GPs, doctors and surgeons. So now they also give zakat themselves. And finally, an education development fund to support those in our community, like our imams and community leaders. Um, in order for us to process zakat, obviously, to distribute it, we, we help people to calculate it, pay online, and then we work with a number of agencies to try and support the applicants with their need and also give them cash or vouchers to support them. We now have a zakat tracker in place, which will allow us to say that you gave your zakat on the 1st of Ramadan, it was distributed on the 31st of October, and it went to three uh, people, a brother in Glasgow who was uh, in debt, a sister in Birmingham who was homeless, and perhaps a, 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 a refugee in London who needed to get into work. Um, what makes us different? As I mentioned, we are the only Zakat-focused uh, uh, organization in the country, within the UK uh, particularly. Uh, although this year we collected 4.35 million, that is a drop in the ocean because overall charities collect about uh, 300 million pounds a year. 98% of that actually goes abroad. Um, so 4.35 million is not a lot. Um, we have invested a lot in technology to make zakat paying a lot easier and, and distribution. We um, were obviously at the forefront of Grenfell, unfortunately. Um, our starting point was looking at four supported housing projects for women who are uh, victims of domestic violence. We distribute and collect zakat from uh, uh, across the UK. You can see that on the map uh, that should come up any minute now. Uh, where are we at the moment? Uh, this year, we will run out of Zakat at the end of December, uh, whereas it really should run out in uh, just coming up to Ramadan next year. So at the moment, whilst we're happy to take Zakat for people that haven't paid it, haven't paid it over the years, have missed their Zakat or have never paid it or have miscalculated it, one of the things that we're looking for is investment in the organization to educate more people about paying Zakat. So we're looking for Zakat, uh, Sadaqah and Riba from people. Because for every pound that we spend, we actually manage to bring in five extra pound, if not eight pounds worth of zakat from people that haven't paid their zakat in the past, have miscalculated it or have missed it generally. Um, so there's a sadhaka jariya opportunity for us to collect uh, help more people. So next year we're expecting at least five to six million pounds worth of applications. Uh, so we are gearing up for that particular period next year where we can try and collect that and distribute it next year. If anybody has any 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 questions, you can email me at naima at nzf.org.uk and I'm happy to answer them. Uh, if you can help us with Sadaqah, Bismillah, you can go online. There's a growth fund that I can point you towards. And if you want calculation support or you miss your Zakat over the years, if them are given, for example, we can help you to try and put that right. Uh, I think we have some of the... the, the probably the most prominent scholars in Jakarta within the UK. Uh, and that, I think, takes me nicely up to the end of my time. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much, Naeem, for your wonderful presentation. So um, thank you all for attending our presentation. And that uh, concludes the formal presentations. We will now move on to the Q&A. Um, so we've had so many questions um, and Towards, uh, so many questions for us to look into. So what I'll do, I'll go over some of the important questions. And if we don't get to all, your, uh, if we don't get into all your questions, please email us, and we'll try and get back to you. So um, the first question um, is um, geared to Brother Ibrahim. Brother Ibrahim, somebody's asking, what would you say about the Fair Trade app? Ah, excellent. Um, so uh, I don't know too much about the Fair Trade app. I don't have anything against it. I think high level principles are that you should invest in apps that allow you to invest actually in the, the stock itself, as opposed to any kind of derivative or any spread betting or anything of that kind. Um, so if you're going to be investing in a company, you need to make sure that you're actually going to be investing in the equity of that company and you get shares for it. Otherwise, that isn't sure compliant. Um, but high level, um, nothing against it or nothing necessarily for it. I know that there's lots of reputable brokers that you can use, people like IG.com, Hargus, Lansdowne, AJ Bell, um, and many others. Okay. And another question um, asking, what would you advise regarding saving accounts? If a bank collapses and you're only insured for 80,000, would you advise yeah. to maintain all money in one bank or move it across various banks? 
Yeah, so I think if, if you have lots of money then uh, and, and it's long term going to be in your account, then A, that's not necessarily a wise thing to do because we talked about inflation, but also B, um, you know, if you if you just need it to be sat there for whatever reason, then yes, yeah, split it across different accounts because each of them is um, uh, is secured up to 85,000 from memory um, by the um, FS, uh, FC, uh, F, FCFC, I can't remember, F, FSCS, I think it is the financial compensation scheme. So um, yeah, split it across, across various different banks. Um, if you have to, if you've got a joint bank account, then that increases the limit uh, to double it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you should, you should split it across various different banks. Thank you, Jazakallah Khair. And a question for Dr. Muna. So how do we join the credit union and what is the common bind partner? Hello. Um, so yes, people can join URB if they're part of an organization that offers them URB. So for example, they're employed by an organization who wants to join URB, or they are volunteering with that, such an organization, or they're family members of people who, are want to, who want to volunteer. We've also got some places of worship. So if you've got a place of worship that um, you want to join us with URB through them, we're quite happy to do that. But for people in this audience, if you're already a BIMA member, we're quite happy to extend your B membership to, to the British Islamic Medical Association and their members. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Thank you, um, Sister Mona. And a question for Ansar. Um, Ansar, does, does Ansar UK, um, UK expats with any help with home finance? Yes, home finance. So does ANSA help with UK expats with any help with home finance? Uh, not currently. Previously, we did a pilot a housing scheme where we bought five houses on joint sharing scheme with our um, investors and all that. But obviously, because of the lack of funds, we couldn't continue that, even though the scheme was very successful. But we are looking in the future to build up some sort of funds so that we can start providing some sort of help towards buy, you know, first buys of the house or work with people in terms of providing short term loans over like 10, 15 years to, to reduce the impact of the interest and all that. So just watch that space on our website. We will be doing something soon, inshallah. And another question for you, brother. There's another question ask, asking, is it ethical investing the same as halal investing? Is ethical investing the same as Halal investing. Uh, well, yes, I mean, as these, far as I know. So, ethical investment is any investment that kind of obviously you can't just say that is 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 interest free. Is is way that is. I mean, you can put an Islamic touch on it to say that it has to be Islamic, but ethically is much wider than that. Which means that wherever you're investing. You're investing in a very ethical way, which has very, very less impact on the on the you know society in terms of what uh, the, the, you know the unfair distribution of the wealth and all that. So they are kind of hand in hand, but kind of two very broad terms, if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. And another question, um, perhaps from Mona as well. Um, how does student loan? How how does a student loan? Sorry. How does a student with a student loan, and they have either graduated or not, calculate how much they care to give? Hello? So I'll, I'll make a start on this question because the way people calculate the cat is very much dependent on their own personal circumstances. So the student loan may be just they will have other kinds of loans, they will have other kinds of income, whether they reach the nisab or not, and so on. So I think National Zakat Foundation already have that within their calculator. They will help people work through the Zakat, whether they're students or graduates or, or have other forms of loans and income. Okay, a question for National Zakat Foundation. Uh, somebody's asking, how has the COVID affected you? And what can we do to help the National Soccer Foundation to, to keep it going? Uh, 
Um, we we used to get one application an hour. Now we get four applications an hour. So our zakat will run out at the end of this year. So what do we need? Yes, we need zakat. Number one, if you haven't given it um, or if you missed zakat. But secondly, what we need, as I mentioned earlier, we need sadaqa or if you've got interest in your bank account, we need that. Why? Because we can turn that into five to eight times worth of zakat by educating people, reaching out to people that haven't given. Um, so really, we need funds to try and uh, invest and, and try and raise five million pounds next year because the applications will be about five to six million. And if we just carry on with what we have, because the zakat that you give, all of it actually goes to the recipient. A 10% admin fee is kept only for those workers in the organization that actually process and verify the applications and work with the agencies. The rest of the organization survives on about 12% gift aid, the sadhaka and interest that people give us. But for us to expand further and actually collect more zakat, this is what we really need next year. Uh, we need sadhaka and, and, and riba right now from people that are sitting in their bank accounts. I'm not saying that riba is acceptable, but many of us have bank accounts where interest does come into it, and we've got nothing to do, we don't know what to do with it. We can use it to, uh, you know, purify it in effect and, and collect the card. Um, so, yeah, if you haven't paid the card ever before, you've missed the card, you've miscalculated it, Bismillah. If you've got Sadaka, brilliant, a thousand pounds, Alhamdulillah, will help us to get another five thousand pounds worth of the card by reaching out to far more people around the country. But we are in a very difficult situation, and especially on the back of um, the furlough period finishing this month. The, the, the applications, unfortunately, are going to go through the roof. Thank you for your answer. There's quite a few questions for Brother Ibrahim. Uh, somebody's asking, um, Brother Ibrahim, for someone who's opted out of the NHS pensions early mm -hmm. in their career and four years have passed, what would you advise? Would you advise them to start now from scratch? And if this is a way to buy pension years, uh, is it a smart thing to yeah. do considering I've left four years? I won't worry about it. I won't worry about it too much. Four years isn't massive. Um, I just start now. And uh, somebody else asking, Brother Ibrahim, for someone who's uh, similar to the pension question, but um, Brother Ibrahim, is the money box app halal? Uh, the money box app, from uh, memory, is uh, a way of helping you save. Uh, oh, sorry, helping you track your spending. Um, so to the extent that it just does that, that's perfectly permissible. All, all it's doing, I understand, is just aggregating all your uh, savings and bank accounts into one place so you can track what you're up to. Um, to the extent it does that, that's fine. If it's giving anything else, like, um, you know, it's lending you money or anything like that, then that could be problematic. Uh, but high level, I don't see any issues with it. And uh, somebody, you have so many questions actually. Somebody's asking, do we need to have credit card to be able to access Islamic mortgages? I uh, don't think you need to have a credit card to Islamic, uh, access Islamic mortgages. You do need at least somewhat of an Islamic, uh, of a credit history. Uh, you can use a company called Lockbox. So if you uh, search Islamic finance guru Lockbox, so that's L-O-Q -O box then uh, you can sign up with them. And uh, that's a completely uh, interest-free way of getting a credit history. Um, if you are comfortable with going for a credit card and making sure that you pay off the, the debt before any interest is due and you're happy with that approach from an Islamic perspective, uh, we personally are, then, then I think that's a very prudent way of building up at least somewhat of a credit history. Um, and then make sure that you're on the you know, electoral roll, um, and you know you've uh, ID that you you try and stay in one address for as long as you can that sort of thing um, to boost your credit rating. But yeah, you will need at least somewhat I think of a credit rating for you to get any kind of major loan. And somebody else asking, it's halal to invest in a company to buy shares. Yeah. As long as it's as long as it's Sharia compliant. Um, so if you look for halal stock screening uh, on Google, you'll find a whole bunch of content, a lot of it by us, but other people as well. Um, you need to make sure that it is a qualitatively halal. So you're not investing in uh, British American tobacco. Um, at the same time, you also want to make sure that it hasn't got too much debt. So there's some technical criteria there. And again, we've we've done a free article on this. Uh, so if you just search for you know, screening halal stocks or something, it will come up on Google. Okay, and somebody else is asking, um, can you recommend any apps or websites to filter 
Sharia uh, compliance or stocks to ensure they're Sharia compliant? Sure. So I think there's there's a bunch out there. Uh, Zoya, Islamically, Finispear, and others. I think um, of them, I know that they often give uh, lots of uh, you know conflicting views. And our personal opinion has always been that uh, it's best to just do a manual check. So you know the way to do it, we've listed out on our website. Uh, if you really want to get into it, we also have like a, a short course um, that you can buy to show you how to do it. Uh, but the reason why you know, I think it's best to just do it manually is because you're ultimately going to be investing, what, 20, 30 times max in the year. And if you're investing in stocks, then it is a worthwhile activity from a due diligence perspective to really get into the annual accounts of the company. And if you're scared about doing that, then quite frankly, you shouldn't be investing in stocks and shares because you're investing on um, you know your emotions or you're investing on like a, a tip from a friend that's not a scientific way of uh, investing your money if that's you probably not where you know the stocks and shares is probably not for you if you are happy to dig into accounts uh, it's not it's not painful it'll take you about five minutes and once you've kind of done it a couple of times um, it'll inshallah be straightforward and somebody else asking you brother um, brother Ibrahim how do you feel about investing in gold bars uh, I personally uh, feel that uh, investing in gold is not something I am that keen on um, uh, and I'll give you a reason as well and the reason is that gold fundamentally does not increase or add value to the world it's just a store of value it's just a store of assets that is inflation proof but if you leave a bar of gold for 20 years then you're not going to become richer Whereas if you leave a stock or a property or something like that, then you are going to be richer over 20 years. Um, having said that, if you you know if you want to have like a two to five percent um, you know percentage of your portfolio in gold as a kind of hedge against um, everything else, that's not a bad thing necessarily. And gold obviously has increased in price over the last few years. Um, so, you know, you're not going to be hurt in any way, shape or form. But, um, you know, I think there there are genuine, uh, you know, differences of, of opinion in terms of investment strategy amongst people who are investment experts as well. My personal thoughts are I probably won't bother, but I know lots of women already have gold. So if you have gold and you like gold, then, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's fine. Uh, just, you know, don't think of it as, you know, your investment and like, you know, don't, uh, make it a big part of your investment portfolio. And uh, we're running out of time, but this question is to any any panelist that would like to answer. So a few people are asking, is it practically possible to totally avoid riba in today's society? I think, I think that's a really good question because um, credit cards and so on do touch us all. But if we are trying to avoid riba wherever we come across it, I think that's the best thing that we can do. Even though we might have already been touched by riba before, what you do from now on, trying to avoid it as much as possible, is the best thing that you could possibly do. I think it's, um, I'll just add that um, it's embedded in the society very deep. It's actually making the intention, you know, making commitment that I'm not going to deal with any interest related, related transaction from now on, and then working your way through getting rid of any interest bearing debt over the time. And of course, Ansar and other colleagues here who are talking, we all can help people in, in, in taking that journey. It's hard and no, you know, there, there's no reward without any hardship. So you got to take that journey. Makes sense. 